joints on the left, living the hills, but I still get a spread. Sorry for the live, but I still reinvest it. Fear how I feel, then you feel less a blessing. I just want the lesson, I just want protection. I'm up and I'm down, but the sound like progression. Farmer never plans if he waits for perfection. I think it's to the uh, down. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Sal Gilberti, the CEO and founder of Tucrium Wheat, W E A T E T F. We got him here. So, Sal, how are you doing, man? Doing fine. Great to be here. All right. Well, I, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier. The insights that I've I've gotten, it's just, it's been crazy. I know the, everything going on with weed is wild. But before we start talking about any of that, I mean, just tell us a little bit about who you are. How'd you get into this? And like, even Tucrium itself, like, what is it and all of that? Sure, sure. I, I, I started uh, trading right out of school. I got hired by Cargill um, right out of college and just loved trading. It was always in energy and ags. That's that's what I started in. Um, kind of worst thing that ever happened to me. I, I My first stock trade was warrants before they even had options. It's going way back. And I doubled my money in 11 days. And you, you just get, <laughs> you get hooked. So I did the right thing, though. And I went to Cargill right out of school, and I learned the fundamentals of commodity trading. And it was wonderful. So along the way, and I've been around a long time, I, I went through the deregulation of crude oil in the early mid 80s, saw crude oil futures start start trading, uh, saw the deregulation of natural gas in the late 80s, early 90s, helped get that contract going. Um, working with the New York Mercantile Exchange was a natural gas physical a, a paper, natural gas trader in, in uh, pipelines um, and then then came into uh, uh, ethanol. In the early 2000s, I I had blended gasoline for Cargill. We, I started trading for Cargill and blending leaded gasoline. That's how far back I go. That moved to unleaded gasoline, which is is the additive is is methyl tertiary butyl ether, complicated stuff. Anyway, long story. Did short, you learn all this in started, school? Uh, no, actually, I learned way more. Here, okay, I went to school, <laughs> went to college, did pretty well, but I learned more reading the Wall Street Journal taking the train into work every day for Cargill uh, than I did in school. And I learned more in the markets and I, and now everybody's so lucky to have um, things like you do. And that's where you learn. Now. That's where you learn. If you're interested in it, follow it, learn it. You're going to, you're going to learn. You're going to be great at it and focus. When I started the ethanol contract, I didn't even know what ethanol was. I heard George Bush give a speech. I had blended gasoline for Cargill. I knew that it was the future when I found out that, that ethanol was just grain alcohol and you could drink it. In fact, most people don't know that ethanol plants who make it, they put it in these big tank cars to send it to places and they poison it with gasoline. Two, they stick 2% gasoline into that tank car mm. to poison it. Otherwise, they'd have to have a liquor license. And most what? Know that. That's, that, yeah, that's what I did not know that at all. Wow. Yeah. So half of the gasoline <laughs> produced in a refinery needs an additive. It's ethanol. I knew that was the future because ethanol comes from corn and sugar. I started trading those commodities, and I was at a liquidity desk inside of a division of SockGen, buying and selling, um, providing liquidity for institutional players. And somebody came into my office one day and said, I'm going to start this thing called an ETF, and I'm going to put oil inside of it, and it's going to trade on a New York Stock Exchange. I didn't know what an ETF was, but I thought it was brilliant because through my whole career, I couldn't trade futures, wasn't allowed. It would be a conflict of interest. So if I thought oil was going up, I had to buy Exxon or buy Mobile. They were separate. So and wait, so ETFs didn't exist then, or what was, or were they just they on the cut? And nobody knew what an ETF was. The first, I think, the first ETF, the anniversary of it. Uh, in fact, the ETF there was like the nineteen or twenty year anniversary yesterday. I think of the Qs. Oh wow! Watching. And they were they were the second ETF. The first was was uh, I think the Spy, and I, it's about twenty years old. And ETFs are really cool. They package things inside of them, and. They move with the value of the thing that's inside of them. I was going to say, can we, cool. can you give like an explanation for some people for that? Because we've, we've addressed this a lot. People kind of like, they get confused with what it is. I know we're, we're going over your history a little bit, but since we're already here, I mean, yeah, how let's, would you, let's go for it. how would you explain an ETF then? Like you said, do they hold things? It's a package. It's a package that trades like a stock. And inside of that package, you can put anything you want. And so most people don't have access to commodities. They can get them, you know, it, investors can get them through trading a futures account, but most people don't trade futures. Most people should not be fu trade futures. Um, and, but, but if you have somebody like, like we do, like 
like two cream does and other other etf firms do too we can package those uh, you know a group of, of futures put them inside an etf and you can trade the etf on in our case the new york stock exchange just like a stock and that makes it easier for people to access hard to access things and that's that's what's great um it, you know i mean everybody knows the advantage you, you trade spy Okay, and that's not my fund. I don't get paid for saying this, but you trade spy instead of having to buy all five hundred of the S P five hundred stocks. You trade one stock, spy, you're done. It's yeah. easy. So, in, for you know, the wheat wheat fund was in, in the headlines this week. Instead of buying wheat futures, you just buy the wheat fund that holds wheat futures. Now, understand, uh, I'm never going to give investment advice. We just provide the tools. I'm not going to give buy or sell recommendations. But what happens is that an ETF moves with what it holds so what's inside the etf if you hold say wheat futures and they're really volatile like they've been since the war the etf is going to be just as volatile so you have to be careful and understand you're buying into whatever that etf holds the most important thing to do is look into and make sure you know exactly what's inside of your etf because that's what you're buying that's your risk exposure i I may med so like how does it i guess the difference between like a stock goes up in value the valuation stays the same but like with the etf it's it's different right because it's based on what it's holding sure and an etf um and understand they had to fit etfs into the, the stock rules the you know the government's like the vatican it moves really slowly it doesn't change its policy really quickly so when the 1940 act was done in 1940 that that kind of governed the rules for stocks and mutual funds and things like that so we had to fit inside of those rules and they didn't really fit well. So, for instance, when you IPO a company, you invent something, a widget, and your company suddenly is worth, let's just say, $10 million. So you want to go out and you, you, you want to go public. The company's worth $10 million. You file an IPO and you have to say how many shares you want to file for and you get permission. You pay the SEC for those shares and penny each or whatever it is. And you, you basically say – sell a million shares at ten dollars on your ipo well your company's worth a hundred you know ten million dollars well let's say you sell so much stuff and grow and suddenly your company's worth a hundred million how that gets reflected in the market is the the price of your million shares that you've sold for ten bucks now it's a hundred dollars so the price of the shares go up because the the amount of shares did okay and ETF works exactly the opposite of that. The price of your your shares goes up based on what you hold inside the ETF. So an ETF that holds oil, okay, that will go up and down with the price of oil. Or our ETF with wheat, it will go up in the tracks that we hold. If if there's more demand for the shares, we just sell more shares. So you know, go back to the IPO of the ten dollar ten dollar share company. If they sold ten sold a million shares for ten dollars company's worth ten million dollars if the company's going to be worth a hundred million either the share price goes up to a hundred so now you have a hundred times your million shares or you just issue more shares they can issue nine million more shares and now it the price stays at ten dollars but because there are ten million shares that's how etfs work they issue more shares. So that's why the ETFs accurately reflect what's inside of them. The price moves up and down. The price direction is governed by what they hold, not by how many shares are on stake. So then anything, so there's not going to be like, because we have heard people say it like gamma squeeze and all that. It's not like a traditional stock where technically the supply of the shares is limited or fixed. Correct. And I, I actually wrote an article, I don't know when it was, last year for Forbes you can Google it about silver and about the Reddit crowd was trying to, to squeeze silver. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're not, that's not going to work with commodities. Okay. Cause commodities guys will take your money. They love high prices. They make a lot of money in high prices. They'll take your money. In, if commodities inside of an ETF, we just issue more shares. Now our, we, we, they've changed the rules and all the new filings that come out. We, we had to play under the old rules until August of last year where we still had to pick a number as an ETF and we just pick really big numbers and it was never a problem. And you just file for more and it takes a little while and the SEC gives you, gives you approval. But now under the new rules, and this just happened to us on, on Monday, we were given, per, or I guess it was Wednesday, we were given permission by the SEC. We now have an infinite number of shares we can issue in week. And, and that's in, so, and that, like, I think some people get like freaked out if they th- hear that on a normal stock. But in this case, it's to just always reflect the price of the actual wheat futures. 
There you go. You got it. That's all it is. Awesome. All right. I wanted to get that clear. All right. So then let's jump back to the to the founding of it. You said there was only a couple of ETFs that were invented, and then you heard somebody talking about it, and then so where what what kept happening? I heard somebody talking about sticking oil in, and I had never been able to trade you know futures on my own account. I said, wow, I can trade oil on the New York Stock Exchange. Well, I thought about it. I said, well, number one, I think I could do that better, and. Number two, how the heck could there not be any grain ETFs? Because, and I say this all over, people have heard me say it before, the last thing that any human on earth will do is allow themselves, their family, or their animals to go cold or hungry. So you trade what you know. Like Peter Lynch used to say, trade what you know. Everybody knows food and energy. Everybody. And if you talk to people who who trade, you know, other than a 60-40 stock bond portfolio, most of them trade gold and most of them trade oil. And you say, well, how about how about your food? How about grains? They don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so, 11 years ago, I thought that I got to change that, and started two cream. Two cream is the name of an herb. I come from a family that is a farm, and they grow herbs. And I just thought it was a cool name. It's the name of an herb. It doesn't doesn't mean anything. Just call the two cream. I had a lot of trouble herb. saying it at first. So, two cream. Yeah, yeah. Two cream. I wouldn't name it that way again because when you get pressed, the reporters don't want to say the name of your company. They can't pronounce it. <laughs> He yeah, say wheat. Like an easy name. Wheat. Everybody think you know. Everybody thinks you're like wheat. So every time I say like wheat, W E A T, everyone says like wheat with a H. So it's a good name, good ticker. And then Tukriam, I just it just it was hard to say at first, but I, I love it. I think it's unique. It is. It is. That's for sure. So then, all right. So you founded that, and then you got into it. So how how long have you been doing it for? Been doing it eleven years, and uh, corn was our first one. We launched some oil fund, oil natural gas fund. Nobody bought them. We were third and fourth to market. And to be successful on ETF, you have to be first to market. So, we we were first in in corn, first in soybeans, first in um, uh, was second in wheat. There was a note in wheat, and and that went out a bit. That I don't even know if it exists anymore. Um, I'm gonna say you are the and, only and were, right now. You are the only ETF that carries or exclusively carries wheat contracts correct Cor- correct we're the only single commodity etf structure now there were some and there still are there are some notes exchange traded notes and that's different exchange traded note is a debt obligation of the issuer which is a bank so you're an unsecured credit and that that's an okay, etn so too for anybody i'm sure a lot ETN, of people have heard that's that. correct and you know people lost money in the lehman collapse with etns if you own a piece of an etf um they they are structured as their own legal entity ours happens to be a, a partnership structure out of delaware so you own a piece of that i can get hit by a truck when i walk out of this office today two cream can go out of business your money is still your money. That fund will still exist. It's its own legal entity. You, you're not going to lose any. You, you know, you're, you don't have any credit risk um, that that you're exposed to, like an ETN. And that's why ETS took off yes. because people like that. They're they're easy to understand. They're easy to trade, and you're you're not exposed to a, a, you know a credit risk of a company. So even even then, even talking about risk now, I would say to bring this into where we are at here today and all of your experience. How does this moment like stack up historically the volatility we're seeing with not only just all the other commodities, but now like wheat and everything else? Like, how does this compare to, to, I guess, the history of wheat? Um, You know, the history of wheat, I wasn't trading. I was alive, but I wasn't trading in 1972 during what they call the Great Russian Grain Robbery. And people can Google that. And that was before we had a reporting system where where the United States had, you have to report when you sell a big amount of grain to, for foreign delivery. And Russia came in, they knew that their wheat crop had failed. They've always been very important in wheat. They grow wheat in Russia, that's what they do. And they knew they had a crop failure. And they came in and literally bought all the, the wheat in the United States. And they People say they robbed us of our grain. Well, they bought it on the free market, and they they took it all, and that caused wheat prices to go crazy. I wasn't around then. People are comparing it to that. Um, And then 2007, 2008, wheat actually hit its all-time record high on some of the exchanges, like the Minneapolis exchange. Then we still haven't reached that high now, I believe. I I could be wrong, but I don't think we even hit the all-time high in wheat because Australia – one of the top 10 wheat producers in the world had back-to-back droughts in 2000, I believe it was 2006, 2007. And so you, you, those are the two times when I've seen this kind of volatility in wheat, but nothing like this has ever happened. And, and you know, we see the, the limit up day after day after day, limit down day after day after day in the futures. And of course our, you know, our fund saw monster inflows. And Russia, just as a little trivia for Tukum wheat trivia, 
our fund was, we started it in 2011. It sat at $3 million until 2014, literally doing nothing. And Russia invaded Crimea. And our fund in six or six months, a couple of months, either side of that, went to about $40 million. Um, and then it, you know, back and filled and, and got a little bigger. And I think we were at, I don't know, 80 or 90 million the day before Russia invaded, you know. And then what's it at now? Uh, I, it, I can tell you what it's at last night. I got to check my website. The rules are weird. I'm not allowed to tell you what happened today. You have to wait and check our website. No, yeah, of course. But, no worries. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll look while we're talking here. Um, what, what it was last night, it was 341 million. Mm. And, then, and then again, and that's like everybody just reacting to this now and i i remember i'm actually going to pull it up right here you were telling me about like the corn market and like how farmers like they operate with the subsidies and then it kind of has these pops so i'm wondering like i guess will i i know we don't want to talk about the prices but it's saying how long does like how do these cycles last if it just pops like this and goes crazy do you get what i'm saying like yeah well okay so let's just talk fundamentals of grains it's it's fun um, think about grains and remember they're cosmic, okay? Meaning the weather affects them and there's a growing season. You plant stuff in the spring, it grows all summer, and you harvest it in the autumn. And in the winter, there's a big pile on the ground or it's stored somewhere, but just call it a big pile on the ground. It's easy, easy to visualize. And you take from it and you don't get any more grain until the next autumn. And most people don't realize that. So let's just, if you look at, at spot corn prices, so the, the actual price of corn that like, you know, Kellogg's is buying to, to buy a whole bunch of a corn to make corn flakes, okay? Or or a, a, a cattle feeder is buying to feed cattle or an ethanol plant buying to make ethanol. The lowest price of corn seasonally, when, when everything's balanced and there's no war and it's raining everywhere and everybody's happy, things are normal, is either side of October 1st. And why is that? Because four weeks either side of October 1st is the corn harvest in the Northern Hemisphere. And about two-thirds of the world's corn is grown in the Northern Hemisphere. And and you harvest it all at once. There's this giant pile. Everybody's feeling pretty happy and pretty good. And your cattle feeders and your ethanol plants and everybody who has to buy corn for any reason, is there's plenty of corn. And everybody's relaxed. And so nobody – but think about it. Every day, the whole world goes to that pile of corn. So it's, so it's only once so once a year then just that's, that's right. sim year, simple yeah, as that there's northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere so don't forget it's really twice a year but the, so it, it's really interesting corn yeah. the, the major exporters of corn are the United States Brazil the Ukraine Ukraine is a major exporter of corn okay it's a very big deal lots and lots of countries are gigantic growers of all kinds of crops most don't export so soybeans is really easy. In essence, there are three countries that export soybeans. That's it. And in order, it's Brazil, the United States, and Argentina. And Paraguay comes in fourth. They're a distant fourth. Mm. Everybody else, literally everybody else, grows what soybeans they can and then buys from those four countries. And and so some people were bringing that up and actually I would even uh, just throw something in there. What about like, fer how did, would like fertilizer costs have an impact on some of the harvest right, or getting people to plant or not? All right. I'm going to do, I'm just going to start two years ago. Okay. We've, we've got the basics down. The farmers mm -hmm. around the world plant in the spring. They, they grow it all summer. They harvest it in the autumn. And then you have to wait until the following autumn until you get more. Okay, and you have to count on good weather and all that. Well, two years ago, China had really bad weather, really bad. Weather. And interestingly enough, they had too much rain. That rarely happens. There's an expression, rain makes grain. Well, China had so much rain, their main agricultural regions got flooded out. Like those floods. I actually remember that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So they had to come in buying. And actually last year. So I think that year of the floods, they bought more corn than they ever bought before. And China didn't really import corn until about, I don't know, within the last two decades. Okay, China didn't import oil until I believe the 90s. And we can look it up. But so, but once they start importing, they never stop. Why? Populations keep growing. All right. So, and that's I think in the thing you're referring to on our website. Uh, yeah, I think you do have that with the population yeah. growth. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. population growth. So the global population is growing 
the equivalent of twice the population of California every year. So and we all know how crowded California is. Multiply by two, that's how many new people are added to the world every year. Those people, number one, they have to eat. Number two, they use a lot of stuff. So that's good for commodities in general. But commodities, as a rule, trade at their cost of production. And eggs especially trade at their cost of production. Why? Because farmers are subsidized by every government in the world because you get overthrown if your people are hungry. So for the, the, all governments subsidize their farmers. So the normal state of affairs is is grains trading at their cost of production, which you can see, you don't have to know what that is. You don't have to be an expert. Just look at the futures price. So if you look at the front month futures price, and look at a chart, which you can get anywhere, okay? If that's flatlined, like, like corn did for seven and a half years, stayed around three $3.50, give or take 50 cents. That is the futures equivalent cost of production. Farmers are used to, to growing that way and, and operating that way. And it, it just flatlined. But statistically, every five to seven years, you generally have a disruption in supply. And think about it. Um, no one skips their breakfast if it doesn't rain somewhere. Okay. So demand stays. Demand for grain stays. So that pile there's a certain amount that's going to be taken out of that pile and it increases every year. So the, the combined use of corn, soybeans, and wheat, if you take the combined use of them globally, is either the highest it's ever been or the second highest it's ever been every single year since 1960. And that's related to the population growth is what you're saying, right? And then it's just related to population growth and, you know, corn is in everything. They don't call it king corn for nothing. The number one use of corn is to feed animals. So if you, if you, consume any animal product whatsoever not just eating meat but drink drink milk use butter anything that's an animal product that animal was fed with grain okay so that's a very big deal and then so and then also is it fair to say now because even then when i'm looking at the slides here and going over them it's, it's fair to say that the link like because it says corn futures but it's pretty fair to say this operates the same for all agriculture commodities yeah, the patterns may not be the same, but yeah, all agricultural commodities, all commodities in general revert to their cost of production. That's why when you see an oil crisis, okay, and then oil went back to 40 bucks and then then because they were doing shale and fracking and all that. But but when shale and fracking first started, it was really expensive. So if you go back to the, you know, there was a time when break even in oil was 80 bucks, okay? And, and so when you look at these sideways movements of commodities, and by sideways movements, I mean going for a year or longer at roughly the same price band. You you know that you are now at the global equivalent cost of production of, of whatever commodity you're looking at, or the equivalent cost of production oh, in that location. Okay. That's that's and a so, good one. That's a gem. That's a all gem. Right, so <laughs> once you figure that out, if you're a long term investor, you start to layer that commodity into your portfolio. That's what we were told people do. Okay, because why? You're, if you're at your cost of production, your downside's probably pretty limited, okay? Except oil did go negative once, and that there's an interesting reason why, but the, you know that was unique. But most commodities aren't going to go very far below their cost of production, and if they do, they're not going to stay there very long. Or they have to stop producing them, and the price will go back up. So you layer something in your portfolio when it's at its cost of production trading sideways, and then you wait, and when there's a supply disruption – in ags, you don't generally get a demand disruption. Ags are really inelastic. And so that's why you see these wicked price moves. So, you know, we, we this week tried to determine, it, it, it tried to find a price because the, Russia and Ukraine together are 30% of global exports. So remember, I said that everybody, just about everybody grows wheat, but not everybody grows enough wheat for themselves, so they have to buy it. So there are only a few countries that sell it. In, in size and but the exporters when you take the the two that create 30 percent together russia and ukraine are the top exporter of wheat if you took them as one okay well all that wheat's off the market now remember we're just coming out of winter so the wheat from last year was harvested already it's there it didn't disappear it's still in the world somewhere in storage in in russia and ukraine but it can't get out and now they've both banned exports, so they, they won't get out, okay, because they're trying to keep food for themselves. So that's a big deal. And so the wheat markets obviously reacted instantly because in New York City, they didn't sell one less bagel because we can't buy any wheat. 
Everybody's <laughs> still late. They're bagel in New York. And that that's how this works. That's that's how it goes. That's, now, the, here's what's interesting. We'll stick with wheat for a minute. Wheat, winter wheat is, is planted in the autumn, goes to sleep all in the fields all winter, which is what it's doing now in Russia and Ukraine. They grow vast majority of their wheat is winter wheat. That wheat will grow and be ready to harvest in, in June. Okay, so it's going to grow. Doesn't matter if people are fighting or not. Doesn't matter. That wheat in those fields will grow. And understand, we're talking about such a vast area. People are seeing you know, the pictures of tanks and in, in fields and helicopters crashing into fields. That's just that one farmer that gets hurt. There's so much wheat out there. The, it's so vast. The war is not harming those fields materially. Okay, so that wheat is going to grow, and it will be there ready to harvest. The question is, is anybody to be around to harvest it? Are they all going to be fighting or fleeing? And so that that's a huge question. That's what the market's trying to, to, to price in. More importantly, I think that story's over now, okay? The, the, the wheat story probably, the, the market's finding equilibrium. You saw it go up and then go down here in wheat. It's kind of find a balance pretty quickly. It's not going to try and find a new balance until June when they figure out that wheat's getting harvested or not, if it'll be able to be shipped. Mm. In six weeks they would start planting corn in Ukraine. Ukraine provides 13%. In fact, I think it was predicted to be 16% this year of the world's corn exports. So 16% of the world's corn that people who don't grow enough corn and need to buy it came from Ukraine. What if they don't plant? What if in six weeks time, nobody's around to plant because they're all fighting? And by the way, we're hearing on social media for all their seeds, which were supposed to come over the winter, a lot of people didn't get their seeds. A lot of people didn't get their fertilizer. A lot of people didn't get their tractor parts to fix their tractors to get ready for spring. There is a good likelihood that the, the spring planting, which would start in six weeks of corn, either is going to be dramatically reduced or not happen at all in Ukraine. That's really big because that means 13% of the expected exportable corn just going to be gone. It's not going to exist. It's not like the wheat that's in the fields that's going to grow and will be there in June. There isn't going to be that corn. And that, you know, supply and demand is, is, is pretty well balanced in the world. So to lose that much corn is probably going to impact the corn markets. Now, they've been dragged up because of the price of wheat anyway. So they may not have any room in the upside. I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and try to predict the price. But that's going to be the next thing the market focuses on. Hundred percent. I guess. And people were even asking. I mean, does it? If like, let's say, there's a shortage of wheat or a shortage of corn. Like, I mean, is there, is there relative substitutes? Because some people were saying, okay, if wheat gets too expensive, will they substitute other things with corn and vice versa? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Absolutely. In fact, so there there are spreads you trade all the time in the futures markets, and you're just trading the protein value. They call it. They'll say wheat versus corn. You can buy an amount of corn. You know, in the old days when things were normal, at, call it four dollars a bushel. Okay, and you got a certain amount of, of, of fiber and protein that, that goes to your animal. All right. Well, if if wheat protein, the the, the spread between wheat and corn generally. And, is, is you know between around 80 cents to a dollar because wheat has more protein in it okay so it's worth more that's why wheat's worth more than corn on a per bushel basis to a guy who's feeding cows for a living uh -huh. they, they buy a lot of corn or wheat so if if wheat gets too low relative to the price of corn that guy will switch from corn and buy wheat because he gets more protein for his dollar so so yeah they are substitutable kind of uh, right? what wheat's well, kind of wheat corn what about corn. beer prices <laughs> Somebody asked me that. They well, said, "Well, wheat that's barley. affect okay, that." Okay, that's mostly barley. Wheat, you know, they, they make vodka out of everything. Um, I think that the the price that people are going to see the trickle down to is going to be flour and wheat products. I mean, you know, nobody's talking about it, but the, the big pizza chains they're panicking. These guys are wondering where they're going to get their flour. Are they going to get enough flour, and what in the heck is it going to cost? Oh, I didn't even think it's, about that. <laughs> that's no about that. Okay, but commodities people think about that. That's there are people who are doing their jobs, making sure that you know whoever it is that makes a lot of pizza has enough flour, so everybody gets to have their pizza delivered on Friday night. That's there's people working hard at that right now. Dang, that's crazy. So then that's why the price of wheat went crazy. So let me ask that's you about why. even uh like storage. What is this storage process? Like for corn, wheat, any of these, like, I know you said it's like well, a big for, pile, but like, 
how yeah, do they well, go about that? So you can pile it outside, but there, there are grain silos and farmers on farm, on farm storage, they call it, you get in the weeds. It's not, it's not important. There's enough storage for grains because you can pile it outside. Why oil went negative as a quick aside, it's interesting. You can't just shut an oil well off. Okay, when you drill a hole in the ground and the pressure forces oil out, there's a lot more coming out with it. Normally, when you drill a hole in the ground, you get water. You're drilling a well for your house or something. So, the, you know, water junk comes out with this oil. All right, if you get the pressure right, and there's all cracks and fissures in that in that hole in the ground. You get a right mix of oil, and you have a profitable oil well. Okay, that's great. But if you mess with that, you could make those cracks too big and the water comes in and ruins your well. I mean, that happens. So a guy that's pumping oil can't just turn his well off because it changes the pressure and messes it up. So if oil gets too low for a little bit of time, it's worth it for that guy to pay you to take the oil away. That's how oil got priced negatively. Oh, that makes sense because then he has to keep pumping and he's saying, I'll pay you to take it so I don't have to shut off and risk. If it's... If, if it starts to spill on the ground, you have an environmental disaster and your costs skyrocket. That's why oil went so negative so fast. And then everybody just shot. Okay, they actually did shut in. And that that's why oil went negative. That can't really happen for grains because grains, you only harvest them once a year. You know what they are. And you could put them on the ground. You put them on the ground and cover them. They're fine. I mean, they're fine, but, you, you know, you can feed the animals and it'll be fine. So, you know, you're not going to see grains go, go negative. That's just not something that's going to happen. All right. That's, see, that, that's a great question. A lot of people were asking that. And even then now, too, I mean, it's related and in, in even just looking at all of this, the pricing, even moving forward. We're understanding the situation. And, I mean, and what you just said was so helpful. But now, like, is if you wanted to start adding any of this to the portfolio, I mean, do you wait till it's – back around those like production levels or is it like what if because there's people like trying to panic rush into everything and they want to do that what do you what do you think about that yeah so again i'm not you can't yeah no price i can't do that but you know for when you see a commodity especially grains at their cost of production you can see those charts that you're you're looking at on our website Mm -hmm. yeah we have it up here that presentation um you know obviously you layer that in and you wait now that's an investment strategy Okay, for traders, this is this market's how happy can you be? I mean, you get volatility. <laughs> to all you know, options are trading. Options on our funds trade. Options, it, the options volume on our wheat fund went insane. So you know, there's a lot of opportunity. With opportunity comes risk. Obviously, I, I don't know. I think yeah. I, I'm not. I, that's up to each individual person. I can tell you that before the war. We believed because of the bad weather in China, and we didn't even get to soybeans. So I, I talked about wheat. I talked about corn. Soybeans, um, we've been running down the, the, the stocks, and they had a terrible drought in southern Brazil and in Argentina this year and in Paraguay. Paraguay is importing soybeans. They're the fourth largest exporter. They're importing soybeans right now. So there, there's a really tight market in soybeans. Nobody seems to be paying attention to that. And again, the price has been pulled up with this wheat crisis because of the, the – Russia Ukraine situation. So you have to be careful. But I think what people are going to start talking about next is corn. And then after that, they're going to start talking about soybeans. Um, and just because soybeans are the, you know, they're the black sheep, nobody talks about them. But um, those, those are what's really tight. I mean, normally in the US, we're, we have about six months extra. So that pile that I talked about that you harvest and everybody comes and you have to take it for a year until the next harvest. At the next harvest, there's generally about six months of wheat left. So there's a the pile is left to, to supply about six months worth of needs in the United States. We're down to about four right now. Okay, that's manageable. It's fine. You never run out of food. It just gets more expensive. Okay, we're not going to run out of food. But corn, you, we got used to having sixty days worth of worth of corn, and now we're we're down. I don't have it in front of me, but we're down. You know, substantially less than sixty. So I would say you could look, you could, and they have the data, like they have you know public what? data I'll just, on. I'll just look on my website while we're talking. But soybeans, um, that soybeans is a big deal because soybeans, while we got used to having, um, basically twenty five. Here, I'll go to the soybean balance sheet right now. So there's just the wheat soybean. So the U.S. soybean balance sheet going back to ten, eleven, twelve. You normally have between, call it, 100 and 300 days worth of supply. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, that's that's the anti-sex. You normally have between uh, 
18 to 30 days worth of supply. We've gone as high as in 1819. So in the crop year 1819, um, we had 83 days supply. All right. We're projected next year to have 23 days supply. Oh, wow. Okay. And some, some private analysts are saying we're going to have 10 days supply. Because the U- I'm going by USDA numbers, but and this and analysts. this is corn, right? This is soybeans. Oh, soybeans. Okay. Soybeans. No so, way. So you know we're going to be really tight next year because of the drought. And here's what happens: when the farmers going to plant whatever makes them the most money, and he has seeds for and all that. So what we need, and and it will happen. Okay, these prices are twice the farmers' old break even right now. Farmers are going to plant; they're going to rip up their flower gardens to plant corn and soybeans. Trust me, they're going to they're going to plant everywhere they can, and they're going to have monster crops if the weather cooperates and if they have the fertilizer. So back to your that question that people are asking, we don't know. We don't, especially in South America, where they count on a lot of fertilizer, and I guess Russia was a big supplier to Brazil, Brazilian fertilizer. We don't know what's going to happen. So not only have we been drawn down on stocks because of bad weather, now we have the disruption because of war. And now if you have fertilizer problems for next the next crop, okay, this year it's going to be planted in the northern hemisphere that's just starting now to plant like in Texas and it moves north. So, you know, for the next 10 weeks we'll be planting all the way up to Minnesota and the Canadian border. And, and then in, you know, in the beginning of our winter, they will be planting down in the, in the southern hemisphere. Will they have enough fertilizer? That's that's a big big question because we need farmers around the world to plant as much as they can and get as high yield as they can because our inventories are pretty low. They're again, we're not going to run out of food. We just you just don't. Um, but the food could could stay pretty expensive for a while. We were projecting before the war that it would take until South America's next harvest season so not this season where they're harvesting right now still growing and harvesting right now but next season which is would be our winter now we think it'll take until the northern hemispheres next season not this coming autumn when we harvest what we're just starting to plant now but next autumn when we harvest what we so next next so next year pretty much that's correct so we think supplies aren't going to go back to normal The, the earliest they can go back to normal is probably autumn of 2023 so now, there'll be a lot of lot of price movement between now and then. So people have to be really careful. It's, it, these things do not go in a straight line, and they're really. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say because even I'm looking even at that that corn break even chart and all of that, and just looking at like 2011, 2010, and like it seems like there was the rocket, and then it chilled out, and then it shot up again. But yeah. that was like a 12 month delay. Yeah, and that was so. Remember, that's a growing season. So when you see those green circles at the top, and I'm going by memory, what you're looking at. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, if the green circles at the top are when generally before that there was a drought somewhere and it caused production to, to um, you know, subside and demand stays the same. So you go up and you're in that green circle and every farmer is looking at that and they plant like crazy. And it takes a year and they harvest and then you go back down because you have you have enough supplies. And there the time in, so in 2007, 2008, if that's the chart you're looking mm-hmm. at, that drought, okay, that only lasted a year. You stayed up in that green circle and you went back down to the red break-even line in one year because people are just used to that. Every five to seven years have a drought. Okay, big deal. Only a couple of years later, okay, so I guess that ended in 2010. We went back to normal. In 2012, you had that other drought again. Or two, but like, that's a big problem because it happened too close together. The farmers... Farmers are used to every five to seven years having a problem. The world's used to that. You have them two years in a row or you have it within a couple of years. Now those ending stocks that we talked about where you're used to 60-day supply, suddenly down to 40, people get nervous. So you get back up to 60, you're not going to go back down to that break-even price because people are nervous. And we spent a long time because so many farmers planted after the last drought when you peaked in 2012. And that you make higher highs because you're using more. Okay, the, the demand is greater every year, so you, you make higher highs. Yeah, so the so the demand. So if we even compare 2011, 2012 to now, I mean, ten years. <laughs> that means the demand yeah. is probably exactly. It's, it's That's com- a good point. I mean, that, now we produce a lot more too. Don't get me wrong, we produce a lot more, but the, we're in a we're in a new world here. Where we don't know what's going to happen, and the fertilizer is probably the biggest variable right now. Um, the planting of corn in Ukraine. And the fertilizer availability uh, for the for the next year, I guess, is 
is those are the two big variables for grains, I would say. Right. And and then and then I guess even then though, it's at the very least we probably wouldn't see all of this. There's no way this is going to develop in in three months. Then essentially, is you know because a lot. Oh, that's right. I mean, yeah. that's that's the thing. I mean, things move slowly. And understand, this is light speed compared to say um, a mine where it takes a decade to build a mine to, to mine some, you know, metal or something. So that's really fast or, or, you know, it's slow compared to say oil where, you know, if they cut a deal with, with Iran, you have 1.8 million barrels on the market, you know, within a couple of weeks, they just turn the tabs on. So, um, that's grains fall in the middle. Grains fall in the middle. That's and a, you'll see some of these academic studies that see grains are a terrible long-term investment because they, they inflation adjusted, they just flatline. They're always the same with, with occasional blips. Well, that's that's not really the, the right way to look at it. And nobody – how many people buy something and hold it for 40 years without ever looking at it? These aren't stocks where they're going to get a dividend and growth and all that. This is a commodity. You need to watch your portfolio. You need, to, you need to either buy it when it's flatlined and sell it when it goes up because you're an investor just going for the big swing, or you're you're more opportunistic trading on a shorter term time horizon, less than a year, less than a month, less than a, a day or an hour, whoever you are. But you know you gotta watch this stuff. You can't just buy and sell. Yeah, it's, it's there. I mean, especially even with the ETF too. It's just it's not an equity. It's not a company. Yeah, it's not a buy and forget thing. It's a buy and pay attention thing. That's a that's a great way to put it. Very great. I would even say now, even like I'm still like I'm looking at this chart and I'm thinking, how did the volatility and price swings, I guess, how did it feel during like 2011, 2012, like compared to um, today? You know what? Today feels a lot worse. I mean, that that was if you look at that, that was a slow grind up because of the drought. You saw it coming. Um, you and it just people realize, wow, let's see what happens. It, it, droughts start in the in the middle of the summer in the northern hemisphere, so the crops are there. You can't really tell what kind of damage did. You know it's doing damage until you harvest, and the harvest takes a couple of months, and then it takes a while to count everything up and add everything up. So, you know, it takes four, six, eight months to figure out what happened that crop year, and then you start getting nervous about the next crop year. So these things generally, when you have a drought, it lasts, the effects last a good six months to a year, as you can see from some of those charts. So then they go away. This is different. This is, you know, we're, we have disruptions and damage. For, we have social damage. How yeah. many how many people are going to be left to, to till the fields? Depending on literally how many people die or flee in Ukraine. Who will even be there to harvest that wheat? Even if the wheat's there, will they be there? And, you know, how how mad, how how isolated will we keep Russia? Will they put a food and fertilizer exemption for humanitarian reasons and let them export? Will Russia even want to export? So, you know, there's all these questions that aren't going to be answered overnight. Yeah. What about, and now what about this? I heard this one brought up just with the recent swing, even with like wheat. What about like price rejection? Like when it comes to like the real market, I know the prices are swinging and going high, but like there are some reports of people saying that like people are just balking at these high prices of even wheat. Okay, that's demand destruction. That's called demand destruction. That will happen everywhere. You're going to see it happen in oil. You're going to, you're seeing it happen in gasoline already. You will see it happen in crude oil. Um, and and so there, demand destruction is happening. It will happen at. Um, so when the price of oil and gasoline finally comes down, okay, if the price of wheat has a different fundamental, the price of corn, let's say, has a different fundamental and stays higher, ethanol plants will stop buying the corn because mm-hmm. ethanol, you know, is connected to gasoline price. All right. And so if gasoline price gets low enough where they now the, the, the makers of ethanol can't pay the high corn price, which is happening for different reasons. Okay, because Ukraine can't export and it doesn't rain somewhere in Brazil, that they might just say, "All right, it doesn't. I don't make money. I will stop buying corn." That's demand destruction. Okay, and that's how commodities work. So they price high prices cure high prices. There's a reason the demand is destroyed, and then because it takes so long to to um, produce commodities in one way, one one or another, then they get overproduced. So they're not producing enough demand. Demand pushes the price so high that now demand goes away because it's demand destruction. People are used to not buying whatever they stop buying. OK, but the producer is motivated to produce and they're going to start producing and invest in new technologies and new things. And once they start producing, they're not going to stop. And so now they overproduce and you see the price swing down. That's why commodities 
are really volatile because that's that's the fundamental aspect of them that makes that happen. Interesting. That's very so. So, how do you think that'll play out around this time? Do you think we're already like the demand destruction right now? Just even last week, everything kind of topped out there. How do you see it playing out? Uh, if yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. And understand the cash prices of corn. So the the, the, the people who are actually buying real corn and real wheat. They they didn't buy much. They stopped. They didn't buy during the panic. They they stepped they stepped away. So that's you know you can see there's something called basis, which is the spread between the the futures price and the cash price, and and futures went up and and the cash price didn't. So the basis widened. That's how they that's how they price things in the real world, and you know that's how you knew some of this was just panic or a short squeeze on the on the future side. Um, but all you know that seems to be over now in, in wheat. They flushed all the shorts out. Um, and and now you're just going to find an equilibrium on the true supply demand. But until the fundamental picture is clear, you're going to see a lot of backing and filling. So I I think the only thing you can predict is there's going to be very heightened volatility for much longer period of time than we're used. I, to. I agree. I think that's the only. That's even what I've been. I've I've been telling everybody even just time in general, just because it just it just moves so different. I think in a lot of the market right now. I don't know. I feel like a lot of investors, the commodity space is very, uh, it's kind of ignored for the most part besides oil and gold. Uh, so I think that's where it just gets nutty here. So let me ask you this. I don't want to even take up too much time. I mean, what would, what do you think would be the most important thing to, to leave somebody with right now during this situation? If they're looking at what's going on and they're looking at agriculture, all that, I mean, what would, what would be the, the, I guess the, the final bullet point? Oh my goodness. I, I mean, be careful. Just be oh, careful. The, the volatility <laughs> is going to be here. You know, you can you can trade all you want. Be very careful. I, again, with opportunity comes risk. With reward comes risk. Um, just be careful. Be smart. Know your limits. I agree, and I I hope everybody. Li- I'm I'm really glad you said that because I mean I mean we stress it so much, especially like here. I mean it's cool to see all of this stuff moving and all of that, but I think it's like it's like there's so much going on. It's like opportunity, but it's also scary. And then I think a lot of people, if then that's why I mean thank you for providing so much information. I feel like I feel like knowledge is very much power in this space. So I think, and that's where I think people are are getting dangerous if they don't know too much about it. So, it's yeah, we, you know, we try our best on our website, but again, ags are hard and they're complicated um, and they're fun. They're fun. So, we, you know, we, we do try our best um, and follow us on Twitter, follow us on, on LinkedIn, you know, go to the website. We're, one of the things that we faced is the people who have the depth of knowledge that we have about ags, they all work for hedge, com- hedge funds or ag companies and they're not sharing their knowledge. So because we just provide people with the tool to do what they think best and we don't make adv- we don't trade and make or make investment advice we're able to educate everybody so we're, we're trying our best out amen amen and that's a, that's what we, we love it man we love it and we appreciate it so much even then though actually let me ask you one more question with that with like if are you the one who's doing the like the additions and rollovers on the fund or how do you guys even go about that no well, i i run the company we have a trading team um I, you know, there's a team that, that just works on the trading, which has been really hard just, you know, this week we, because we're a regulated company and have uh, publicly traded funds, we have a, a large, um, uh, accounting and, and team and we work with, you know, lawyers and auditors and SEC regulators all the time. So we got a, got a lot of people. This is not a trading operation. We often say it's, it's more a compliance and accounting operation that happens to trade some things. It's, well, it's, you guys, well, you've been doing an amazing job and honestly, this has been just so helpful. Uh, you have no idea. So, I mean, I think we'll wrap it up there. We'll leave it again. Everybody, you got to go follow Sal. Show him some love for giving us this time. I mean, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit, even in the beginning. But, man, this was amazing. Uh, again, I think we already left it off with any final points. So, I mean, I don't know. Should we wrap it up right there? That's it. We're good. Call it a cool hour. All right. Well, Sal... Thank you so much. I mean, just can't thank you enough. And then hopefully, uh, I don't know. I mean, we might need to tap back in here in a couple months. So we're, we're probably going to keep bugging you. All right. Anytime. Happy to do it. <laughs> all right. Awesome.